Here we go, lecture number two on how to evaluate machine learning algorithms and models properly. Like I said, evaluation is creation and there's so many different levels to it. Today we're gonna to talk about ROC curves and operating points and let's get right into it. Here's something that you're gonna bump into a lot as you're doing machine learning. You have multiple models and they make different types of mistakes. Now remember we talked uh, in a previous lecture about a false positive rate, which means what fraction of the zeros does the model incorrectly classify as one, and the false negative rate, which is what fraction of ones does the model incorrectly classify as zero. And if that's a surprise to you, go back and study more because you need to know this. If you didn't, if right, like you need to know. So which model of these two is better? Well, mistakes have different costs. And that depends on what you're trying to do with the model. And this lecture is a lot about, you know, lining up what you're trying to do with what your model's able to do. And by the time this lecture is done, you're gonna have a few new tools for making your model do more than you thought it could. Okay, so anyway, um, mistakes have different costs. In disease screening, you probably want a low false negative rate. And the, you know, the justification for this is that if somebody has a disease, if there's any chance they have a disease, you don't wanna send them home and say you're fine. You want to get a false positive, um, get them to the next level of tests, and you know maybe maybe you do something more expensive, like maybe then you go do a biopsy or you do like an imaging or something. Like, but you don't want a false negative to rule them out before they have the opportunities of getting those tests. You'd rather have a few false positives go to those tests, even though it'll stress people out. It's better overall. On the other side, this one is a little bit more familiar. In spam filtering, you want a low false positive rate because. A, a false positive is I've taken a message from your friend, from your mother, from somebody that you actually want to talk to, and I put it in the junk folder, I've deleted it. That's a false positive and that's really bad. So maybe one of these models, this uh, high false positive rate model would be more appropriate for disease screening, whereas this um, lower false positive rate would be more appropriate for spam filtering. And you may find that you actually would want to use both of these models in the same application where you may want an aggressive version of screening and a, a more passive version of screening and you give either users the choice or we're going to get to a lecture about how to expose machine learning through user interfaces and you might find that you know using one threshold you'd light up one type of user interface and using another threshold you'd light up a different type of user interface we'll get to that in more detail and the trick here, the actual like punchline of this slide is that these two models are actually the same model, just being used in different ways with different thresholds. And so um, even when you're producing a single model, you have to think about how will this model be used and consider the threshold as a very important part of creating the final package that you're going to send to production. Now, just a little review for what that is. We talked through logistic regression. Logistic regression produces a score between zero and one, which we're calling a probability estimate. And it's because it takes the uh, linear model and then passes it through this sigmoid function. Again, more review. If this stuff is like, huh, what's he talking about? Then you better go watch the lecture again. Do your assignments, keep up. Uh, so anyway, so you get this score between zero and one, and then you use a threshold to produce the classification. And we had talked before about using a threshold of like 0.5 as a common thing to do. We also showed that, you know, you could use 0.9, you could use, you could use any threshold that you want. But let's look a little bit at how varying the thresholds can affect what um, the model can do in an application. And here is a little work thing for us to go through together. Maybe I'll do the first one or I'll do a I'll do a little bit and then I'll I'll do the Jeopardy music and or just do it in your brain. So let's say we were using a threshold of 0.5 on this problem. Here's the y hats and here are the true y's. So with a threshold of 0.5, this is below the threshold, so you'd predict zero. This is below the threshold, you'd predict zero. This is above the threshold, and the rest of these are above the threshold. So two out of six, four out of six. Um, or that's the, the raw classifications. And then if we wanted to look at the false positive rate, how many false positives? Here is a zero that was incorrectly classified as one. That's a false positive. So that's one out of, is that the only one? So then the false po is gonna be 0.33. And the false negative rate is zero because all the true ones are classified as one. And let's click a button and see if I got that right. 
Okay, so now take a minute and think this through and try the different thresholds. Um, right. Try the different thresholds. I'll get my head out of the way. Do, 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 do. Okay, just four, they're not gonna ban me for four notes, right? Do, 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 do. All right. So the next one, when we have a threshold of 0.6, we're able to make, um, I mean, that's kind of like totally worse. You wouldn't want to do that because you have the same false positive rate and a higher false negative rate. So there, the 0.6 threshold, you may not want to deploy, but the 0.7 threshold allows you to get rid of all your false positives in exchange for some false negatives. Anyway, simple example to work it through and see what the mechanics are. You don't do it by hand in practice. That's what computers are for. But now let's talk about ROC curves. And an ROC curve is a receiver operating characteristic curve. I didn't name it. I don't know why somebody would name it that. I don't know why we still call it that, but ROC curve, ROC curve, not rock curve, rock curve. Okay, you can say rock curve. Rock curve, ROC curve, this is what it is. And what this represents is here's the false negative rate and there's the false positive rate. Let's see, I think I have the clicks. False negative rate again is percent of ones classified as zeros. I just went through this on the previous slide, but you know, let's triple go through it. And the idea is that you sweep the threshold from zero to one. And each point here is one of the thresholds that you've tried. And then you draw a plot connecting the thresholds. And in some sense, this, this plot here shows you all the trade-offs that your model is able to achieve just by varying the threshold. So with a threshold of zero, everything is classified as one. So the percent of zeros classified as ones is 100%. The percent of ones classified as zero is 0% zero because you're not classifying anything along those lines. Um, threshold of one, all classified as zeros. So again, you have a no false positives and uh, basically everything, every negative is a false negative or every, every false negative that you could possibly have. At this point where you have um, no false positives and no false negatives, you'd say that that is a perfect model. So when you look at an ROC curve, this distance, the delta from the origin of the zero zero down to where your model's curve is, is some sense of like, how close to perfect is this model? So you'd prefer to see ROC curves that kind of tend in that direction. And that lets you know that it achieves good trade-offs across the board. All right, so that's what an ROC curve does. Um, now let's talk a little bit about operating points. And an operating point is the trade-off that you would like to achieve in your application. It often comes through discussion with a program manager or whoever's taking the customer's point of view. It often comes with through discussion with whoever's building the user experience. It comes with feedback from customers to say like, hey, this thing is triggering too much or doing too much, or I'm irritated because my spam is wherever my spam is. Um, we'll talk more in a future lecture about the structure of that conversation, but let's just say when that conversation is done, you might have an operating point, which is like, we really need to keep our false positive rate less than 3%. That's like a product requirement. So now let's go try to build a model that accomplishes that. But before we build it, let's just talk through a little bit about how we achieve it and what does that mean. So here's a threshold of 0.05. That is, you know, you run your model, all the um, sigmoid, et cetera, et cetera. And if you use a threshold of 0.05, this is the trade-off that you achieve. Your false negative rate is there. Your false positive rate is there. You can read them off and say, okay, I could achieve that. Sure, if that's our operating point, we could do it. Um, with a threshold of 0.04, you achieve something different. Threshold of 0.03, you achieve something different. You see as the, the thresholds are getting lower, that means you're classifying more things will be above the threshold. So the false positive rate is going up while the false negative rate is going down. Um, just makes a little sense. And now let's say our target false positive rate was 30%. So how do you achieve this 30% false positive target? Well, you often you can look and find the closest threshold that gets closest to achieving it, or you could take the threshold which is just better than it, or you could do some sort of interpolation. I mean, I guess it depends on what you really need. In this case, um, you might choose to use a threshold of like halfway in between, because that's halfway in between the other two points. Um, and, and I'll say that, remember that you are estimating the threshold on training data there's going to be, or maybe you're going to use some extra holdout data, something along those lines, uh, but you can estimate it on training data. And so the threshold you pick might be somewhat optimistic because if you use it on the same data you've trained on, and in any case, this threshold you pick won't be exactly 
precise when you deploy the model into production. So you always want to check on your test data, is the threshold achieving what I want it to achieve? And all of that's a way to say that um, you might want to be a little bit conservative when you pick your thresholds. And the difference between 30% and 29% is going to be not maybe the biggest deal for this model in production. But now you could imagine a different operating point if you're in the, um, in the uh, diagnosis domain or any domain where false negatives are the, the key thing that you want to optimize for. You could pick a threshold that tries to achieve um, this false negative target of 30%. Same process as the previous one. Another thing that you could do is actually look at explicit costs. Um, this is People talk about this a lot. I've never really seen this in practice. You could say, hey, you know what? Our users get irritated 10 when you delete a good message, and they only get irritated 1 when um, a spam gets into their inbox. And, and maybe some user studies could do this, or maybe there are actually domains where you know the costs. The costs are like, what does it cost me to stock an object, or what does it cost me to ship an object that I don't have stocked? Or you know, you could imagine coming up with actual costs, and then you could pick the threshold that optimizes the 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 total cost of the system, the total cost that you have to spend on the training set. So, like if you if you looked at the threshold of point oh eight, and you said, well, hey, that causes five false positives and sixty false negatives on the whatever data you're using to set the thresholds then you could go back to that table and calculate that, well, that's 110 cost. Let's try a different threshold. That's better. Okay, there's, there's more false negatives, but getting rid of that false positive was more than, a, more than a covered for the cost of those additional false negatives. And you could go again and you can find that, well, for this model, there is a local optimum around there and that's the one we're gonna ship. So, okay, those are operating points and a few ways to think about setting them and the way a way to use an ROC curve to visualize all the different operating points that a particular model is able to achieve. Now, here's a little sample code that is included in the framework. Um, I think I included this just in, like, it's not sort of a library function there. It's actually in one of the framework files. And uh, you can get a lot more sophisticated with this. This is just a very simple way to do it. And in this case, you take in the model that you want to evaluate, the validation data. This could be some kind of holdout data. Or it could be the, the training data. Um, and how many points, how many thresholds you want to try. Calculate the value for all of those thresholds. Array is for the false positive and false negative rate. Then for each threshold to try, evaluate binary classification. That's a library function that you should have written by now. If you haven't started your homework yet, please get, get, a, get a go, get a go. And, um, you're going to calculate the false positive rate on the validation data, your model's prediction on it, and then in the framework, we all the models that I produce, I think all of them, take this optional parameter, which is the threshold to use. So when you implement your models, if you want to use this sample code, you need to make it take this parameter. There's other ways to deal with this. You can do, I mean, actually you can do what you want, but I'd say if you make it too confusing, the TA is going to be very sad if all of you decide to do it in a different way. Please, don't, don't be crazy. Try to follow this pattern as best you can. Um, so anyway, you calculate the false positive rate for that threshold, the false negative rate for that threshold. Here's the test to make sure that you're, you know, you're doing it the way that the function expects. And then you return the parallel arrays of, hey, you know, at index zero in the thresholds array, you can achieve index zero false positive rate while having index zero false negative rate simultaneously. And that's what that little snippet of code does. And you'll probably call that a lot in some of your assignments and certainly everywhere you're going to want to produce an ROC curve. And now we're going to get into why you're going to want to produce a lot of ROC curves, even if you don't have to deal with operating points. And that is to compare models. Because here's an ROC curve that plots two models simultaneously and all the trade-offs that each of those two models are able to achieve. And then by looking at this, you can quickly see properties of those two models and use your intuition to decide which one should I use for which purposes. In this case, model one is better than model two at this 30% false positive rate. It's just better because it can achieve a better false negative rate. And so if that is your operating point, you know exactly which model you're going to prefer. Take it and run. You can do the same thing with on this axis. On this axis, the same model is better. 
because at a 30% false negative rate, oh, I thought that was 30, but was 30, whatever, 4%, whatever it is, doesn't matter. But you know, in this region where your operating point sort of falls, you can see that this model, the um, dotted line model, which is model one, is achieving better trade-offs. So no matter where you are in that region, it's a pretty safe bet that you know which model you're gonna to wanna to ship, take it and run. And so as you're optimizing parameters in um, the assignments that we're gonna be doing, you might choose to look at this sort of an ROC view when you're saying, ooh, what feature selection should I do? How is adding you know, these heuristic features affecting my overall model's quality? Which part of the curve is it boosting up? Is it costing me something in another part of the curve in exchange for the boost that I'm seeing at a particular part of the curve? And this is a very useful thing to do, particularly um, when you're dealing with, uh, like if you're just doing raw accuracy and using that to guide your model, you might end up with issues in like this region and that region where you have certain features that really are, when they're, they're very strong, and when they're right, they're super right, but when they're wrong, they're super wrong. And so you may see like some bad behavior in these kind of like edge cases where those features are like tripping in. And you just, so you might, you just might, you know, optimizing via raw accuracy for a model that you're gonna use at a different operating point is not a great thing to do. And so you might wanna use ROC curves or you might wanna change your evaluation framework to actually optimize for the point that you're going after. Now, looking back at these two curves, one thing that is clear is that model one is actually better no matter where you move these operating points to, model one is actually better. I mean, maybe not down in there, but that's kind of garbage range anyway. You're probably not gonna be using that. Um, I mean, you might be, but it's, let's just say model one is better according to every trade-off. So if you're doing a modeling process and you've tried a different model structure or you've added a whole bunch of new features and you see an ROC curve that is looks like this, where the new ROC curve dominates the old one, you're heading in the right direction. Like throw away the previous baseline and make this your new baseline because it's better everywhere. There's, there's no question, move forward. All right, so looking at these things and eyeballing them and saying, hey, model one is better than model two at every possible point, that's one way you could do it. But another thing you might wanna do is say, well, how much better is it? And um, one way to think about that is what's called the area under the curve. And so that's under the curve. And if you calculate this area, um, you could see that a model with a lower area under the curve is further away from that ideal point. So a lower area under the curve means that the model is worse. A perfect score would be a model that looks like this. It just goes boop, boop, except it doesn't, it stays in the lines. Um, and that would have an area under the curve of one. And in this case, the area under the curve of the better model is 0.97. And I know I said the perfect score is one and here I wrote 97, bad on me. Um, and then model two, it is 0.895. Model one is significantly better than model two. And you would just, you know, without having to eyeball a curve, this is a way to take that whole curve and put it into a single number that you could use in a computer program when optimizing. Um, if you need to calculate the AAUC, I'm not gonna tell you how to do it, just go look it up, it's pretty simple. Here's another useful thing with the AUC, kind of a backstop check, is like, look, this model here is essentially randomly guessing. And if you see an ROC curve that looks like a diagonal line, you're doing something at least a little bit wrong because you might as well replace your model with a coin flipping machine. And if you have a model that looks like that, <laughs> you're doing something really wrong. And I've never seen that, but I've heard that people, no, actually I have seen, I, you know, I have produced AUCs that look like this that are worse than guessing. And often it has to do with a bug. I like, instead of doing gradient descent, I implemented gradient ascent so that at each step it made a worse model, a model with more loss. I've also had cases where I would um, mess up the indexes in feature selection or in feature mapping so that I learned a weight for the word the, but I applied that weight to the word like um, offer or junk or whatever it is. Looking at ROC curves especially early in the process is a great way to figure, man, <laughs> I'm not much better than random guessing. Am I sure there's not a bug here? And it's also 
um, a nice thing to do to bring in some sort of a heuristic baseline. So you could say, hey, is my model beating just like the three handcrafted rules that I made? Um, I don't know that I have a slide on this, but let me just take a quick aside and say that the models that we're dealing with all take the threshold parameter and that's fine. And so you can do a nice sweep like this. Some models like a heuristic, like I just proposed, like let's just say um, every message that has the word to the left is spam. That's my heuristic. I want to ship it. That doesn't have a threshold. It's just like every message that has to the spam, those three words is flagged as a one and every other message is flagged as a zero. What that results in is just a single point on this curve. So there is no threshold there. It's just that's the false positive, false negative trade-off that that particular heuristic rule achieves. And then you can look at a model and if the model is like below that, then your heuristic is better than your model. And if the model is above it, like these two are, then the model is better than the heuristic. And, and if, you know, if it's above it in both directions, you could say that model dominates that heuristic no matter what trade-off I'm looking for. So you might want to, in practice, have a few little like handcrafted points on this graph just to let you know that, hey, you know what? I'm modeling something better than the easiest thing I could try. Here's a little bit more about ROC curves and using them for comparison because you're almost probably like not very often <laughs> gonna see uh, one model that completely dominates the other. It, I wish it happened more, but it usually doesn't happen. And usually you see this type of thing where there's a cross, which is for whatever reason, model one is better in one portion of types of trade-offs that you might wanna make and model two is better in a different portion of the types of trade-offs you might wanna make. And if you're shipping an application with a low, um, aggressiveness filter and a high aggressiveness filter, then which one should you use or should you ship them both? It's something you got to think about. Um, at this particular point, you'd say, hey, this is where they cross and they achieve the same trade off there. But model one is better when you need a low false negative rate. Model two is better when you need a low false positive rate. Um, it's just a thing that happens. And the AUC in this case can be a little bit misleading because model one can have a higher AUC, but be actually worse at a part of the region that may be more important to you. So you can't just guide yourself just with the AUC. So here we, you know, <laughs> model two worse AUC, but may be better at what you need if you're looking for a low false positive um, model operating point. Another common thing to do is to be like, Look, these, these really extreme regions are a little bit degenerate. They're not often used. So it's very common to zoom in on a point of the ROC curve. In this case, um, we'll take this box here and I've sort of warped it, which is okay, but it just, it, it allows you to say, look, low false positives are very important to me. So I care a lot about the delta of one or two false positives. And so I want to like, zoom in on that area and use this as discussion to make decisions in my modeling process to see, am I going in the right direction? And you might get very familiar with a zoomed portion of the ROC curve for the application you're working on. And you may look at hundreds of different variations of this and have a really strong sense of, you know, what this means or what this means or what this particular shape means. Now, ROC curves, one way to do it, and that was false positive rate and false negative rate. It's also possible to do what's called precision recall curves, PR curves, um, and that just replace the false positive with the precision and the false negative with the recall. These are a little less intuitive to me, at least. I think it's more about which background you came from. To me, I'm always looking, I'm always looking at these and I'm kind of like, what's going on there? Because they can go up, you know, they can go down, they can go back up, whereas an ROC curve is like a kind of a smooth, by definition, it's gonna be smooth and continuous. Um, but let me walk through the interpretation that you might get from looking at this PR curve, precision recall curve. Um, and we'd start over here. And so we'd say this axis is the recall that you're able to achieve. And this is the precision. So if you start the threshold near one, that means, you know, the threshold at one means that you require the model to output absolute certainty before classifying something as spam or whatever it is you're classifying. So every single point that the model evaluates with thresholds near one, it's, it's likely to get right, you know, because the model is hopefully sorting ones to the top. So the first few, as you're sweeping the threshold down, the first few um, samples that the threshold crosses your, your prediction for them are likely to be correct and you're gonna have a high precision. But you know, you have a pretty low recall because you're not flagging many things as spam in this case. 
um, high precision, low recall. Now you move the threshold a little bit further and you start to classify a bunch of zeros as ones. And what that does is it doesn't help you with the recall because you're actually making mistakes. So you can see the precision drop without the recall going up. Um, this type of a big drop like that tends to occur. I mean, I've, I guess I, I'm not surprised by seeing it. And in general, my interpretation, I, I talked about this story a little bit before, is like maybe you added a handcrafted heuristic, which is really good at catching the spam it catches, but is also generically sort of confused. So this is um, a, a pretty good indication that you have a strong feature that may not be generalizing like you like, or may, maybe it's fine, maybe that's what you need it to do, but you might find that every message on this side of that drop has the feature value of kind of one, and then everything over there doesn't have the feature at all because you know things that have it just basically get classified as spam. Right, so that's what's going on at the start of this curve. Then as you move along here, this is you're pushing the threshold down and down and down and lower and lower and lower. And seeing this sort of thing where the precision is either like slightly trending up or it's staying kind of flat just means that the incremental accuracy of each additional training sample that you classify as one as you move the threshold down is staying pretty consistent. And that's good. And so if you were to keep sliding the threshold down until the you start to see it curve off like that, you're in the sweet spot of what the model's doing. That's the range where, you know, the ratio of correct to mistakes is staying pretty constant. And that you might want to look for setting a threshold. If you want to say, well, how do I get the most out of this model in terms of PR? You might want to look at that point for the threshold, unless you have some particular precision related operating point that you need to optimize for. And then at this point, you start to see that it falls off. And that is like all the features that the model knew how to use that are helping it make predictions. We're getting to the samples that don't have those. These samples that it, you're, you're pushing the threshold down and down and down. Maybe your threshold's down to like 0.3 or 0.2. And these are things where the model is like, no, nah, I don't think that's spam. And you're like, you must classify it because I need recall. I need recall. Keep pushing the threshold down because I need that recall. And it starts just going, it kind of falls and falls and falls. And then at a certain point, it starts to fall off a cliff. And all ones are classified as one. So you have a very high recall rate. But you know the cost of it is that you really got into a region where your model wasn't so sure what was going on. So you start to create a lot of problems in terms of really driving your overall precision down. And now remember, precision is among everything that you classified as one, what fraction of that actually was a one. So as you're, as you're chasing recall, you're going to be hurting yourself on that precision stuff. The final thing that you might do there is say, well, let's use a threshold of zero where everything is classified as one. So you would have 100% recall and your precision would just be proportional to the fraction of data in the training set that is one because, you know, that's, that's what your precision could be. Like if 15, in this case, it looks like 15% of the samples were ones. There you go. All right, now let's do a summary of what we learned in this lecture. Like I said, the second in how to evaluate machine learning models and machine learning systems. And as I said, evaluation is creation. As I said, I guess more than once. So the ROC curve part of evaluation leads to the operating point part of creation, which is how do I take this model and craft it into a form that I could ship it off into production and use it. And a big part of that is that you want to adapt trade-off between the types of mistakes the model is making. And the way you do this in general is change the threshold. You have a model that outputs some sort of score or a probability, and you vary the threshold to the point that achieves what you need to achieve to make your application run correctly. ROC curves allow you to visualize all possible trade-offs that a model can make and comparison of models across the types of trade-offs. So you could find out that one model is better at everything, or you can quickly visualize regions where one version of your model dominates another version of your model and vice versa. A useful tool to, at a kind of abstract level, not a perfect tool, but an abstract level is to look at the AUC, the area under the curve, which is an aggregate measure of quality across all possible trade-offs. Something with a higher AUC is generically better, although as we saw in one of the samples, a high AUC doesn't exactly mean that it's going to be best for the operating point that your application requires. Operating points are the specific trade-off your application needs. Often they'll come through discussions with multiple stakeholders like program managers, UX people, um, user interaction studies, user studies, user feedback, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But once you know what operating point you're trying to achieve, you choose a threshold on the output of your model's probability that 
gets you close to that operating point on holdout data or sometimes on training data, there's some subtlety to it. And I think we'll talk about that some more when we talk about various considerations in um, machine learning engineering and doing some of this stuff more in practice. But um, you may end up updating your thresholds more often than you update the model itself. For example, you might reset thresholds every day, but only retrain your model once a week as users come and go and things get different, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the point of that also is that your thresholds are now another part of your model. So you don't just ship the model, the parameters, the weights of the model. You now have to ship the feature creation and selection parameters, and you also have to ship a threshold, and all of those things might need to be updated independently. Anyway, there you go. Another tool in the quiver, um, arrow in the quiver, <laughs> tool in the toolbox, something in the something. I'll see you next time.